Is confirmed that you can see my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You yes, can see visible. the screen. Okay. Thank you. Just a moment. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank the entire team at Prerna College and uh, the invitation and the warm welcome uh, with which uh, you have uh, invited me in the session. So thank you so much for that. It's a go good opportunity to connect with the motherland through this seminar. Right, so I'm still a work in progress, uh, as I call myself. So I'm not yet a finished product. I'm a work in progress, trying to fine tune my skill sets as I move on, and probably I will die as a work in progress. <laughs> Never will become a finished product. But anyways, thanks a lot for this. I will take around 50 minutes uh, for this talk, and I believe there is a mix of uh, students and faculty members. So I've tried to make the presentation as laymanish as possible. And if there is any questions uh, going forward, do not hesitate to put it to the conductor. And probably at the end of the session, we can take some questions, right? Or if the question is pressing, you can interrupt in the middle and I would be happy to uh, respond to your questions, right? So you might have understood through the introduction that one of the areas that I specialize is services. So services is my bread and butter. So I, I always say, just like Coca-Cola, I eat, drink, sleep services, right? So most of my 95 to 99% of my research is in the space of services. So far, I have published 75 articles uh, in my career of 10 years. Uh, with an H index of 37, Google Scholar citation 5,287 by today. And if you see, 99% would be in the services domain. So I take pride in that and no heavy head, nothing. It's just a learning process. So research is a learning process. So hence, I've today's session is designed around services, okay? So there are three forces, and you know most of you are interested in marketing, as I ask you, because it's a it's a certificate program in marketing management. However, I've taken the liberty to talk about marketing or services. Now, although India is still an agrarian and a manufacturing economy, but we are making a move towards service economy. However, if you look towards the West, towards most of the developing nations, considering. United States of America, Australia and New Zealand, Europe, mostly Western Europe, most of the developing nation have actually transpired into the space of service economy. So services comprise almost 70 to 75 percent of the gross domestic product of the developing world, uh, developed world, I'm sorry. And the developing world, countries like India and China are still primarily manufacturing, but slowly we are getting into the space of service economy. So I believe services has the dynamicity to add and contribute to the growth of the nation, right? So we'll provide you a couple of uh, two cents from our own research and hope that will be useful. So when we talk of marketing of services, in the current times, there are three key factors that are affecting services, right? One is the technological factors. And I'm sure I, I, I was just trying to count how many people, close to 50 participants are there. And you know, all of us are connecting through this interface called Google Meet, which is nothing but an advanced form of technology, which has actually killed the distance. So long ago, I read a book called The Death of Distance. So if you ever, ever get time, do read that book called The Death of Distance. So all of the Zooms and the MS Teams and the Skypes and the Google Meets have done, they have killed the distance. All of you are, must be sitting on a mobile phone or with a mobile phone, a tablet device, right? An Alexa at a home, a Siri on your phone or a Google Home Mini. All of these are nothing but technology has actually become a part and parcel of our lives. We just cannot imagine our lives without technology. So that's one key factor that is impacting not only marketing of services, but marketing as a whole, as a discipline. There are socioeconomic trends. If you look around yourself, socioeconomic trends again are impacting how we do marketing, not only of products, but also of services. 
And finally, the geopolitical trends. If you look, there is another book which I request you to read called The Tectonic Shift by Jack Set and Raj Sisodia. Tectonic Shift is all about how the entire geopolitical space is, is kind of a quelsing or moving from the developed world to a developing world. So the economic powerhouses are getting rejigged. So that book is entirely about geopolitical trends. But today's topic is primarily technological trends. I'm no expert in socioeconomic trends. I'm no expert in geopolitical trends. But yes, I have some interest in the technological trends and how it affects marketing and marketing services. So today's talk is on um, one specific technology which most of us know now is artificial intelligence. So what I'm going to talk about in the next 45 minutes is how artificial intelligence is impacting marketing of services, right? And this services is a very broad term. This could be your mobile telecom service. This could be your financial service. This could be your healthcare. This could be your hospitality. You imagine any service, you just cannot overrule the impact of artificial intelligence on services. Each and every service is being transformed by artificial intelligence. So we will give a brief overview of artificial intelligence and how it is transforming services. Some of the commonly used technological terms, which all, almost all of us are aware about today, artificial intelligence, there is a lot of smokiness around smart intelligence. There is a lot of opacity around smart artificial intelligence. Everybody talks about it, but very less number of people actually understands what is artificial intelligence. So today's talk is not to unpack artificial intelligence and its definition. For that, you have to read books. You have to read books called, uh, like Artificial Intelligence and how uh, it impacts competitive advantage from MIT uh, Sloan uh, uh, Press. And there are hundreds of books on artificial intelligence and, artic uh, and articles in, in premier journals. So my job is not to, to provide you definition. Google can provide you better definitions than I can. But still, what from our research in the last two to three years, what we have concluded that we have more questions than answers about artificial intelligence. So if anybody is interested in doing research on AI, this is the time we must make a move. Machine learning, some of you must be expert in the, in the audience today. Physical robots, robot pro processing at, uh, automation, chatbots are a thing. And the, the, the next big thing, and I was reading quite heavily, I'm reading a new book called Navigating the Metaverse. And Metaverse is the next big thing they are saying, but whether it is going to be the next big thing, right? So whatever we do in the physical world, everything is going into the virtual world. So your mall, you'll have a virtual mall going forward, right? So these are some, not all of the technology that people and businesses and economists all over the world are talking about, right? Some AI applications that you can think of today, these are nothing but your automated driven cars, right? Where you don't need to drive, the car drives itself. Then you have the birch box. In the retail sector, Stitch Fix, again in the online retail space. And then you have IBM Interact. Now, these are a group, a just few examples of AI solutions, which we name as disembodied AI. This is disembodied AI means the AI which does not have a physical body, right? However, like for example, Siri. Siri could be another example of a disembodied AI. So you say, hey, Siri. Right. Some of you might be using Apple. Siri is also an artificial intelligence conversational agent, which does not have a body. So when you do not have a body, we call that AI as yes, disembodied AI. However, there are some embodied AIs also. Embodied means like us, which has a physical form, a physical like structure. Right. right? Oh. Oh. Can you please mute your mic? Someone has unmuted your mic. So embodied AI, these are some of the examples of embodied AI. This is Sophia. Sophia was the first humanoid robot to feature on the Cosmopolitan magazine's cover page. Sophia was the first robot to become the citizen of a country, right? This is Fabio. Fabio was the first 
robot to be fired by a retailer in Scotland. And this is a Japanese, I'm forgetting the name of this robot. She is a news reader in Japan. So robots are slowly. Now in Perth, in some restaurants and some bars, they have introduced robots who serve food and serve wine and beer and liquor for, uh, to you, right? So slowly and steadily, embodied robots are also coming into our daily life in the business space. It has been in manufacturing for a long, long time. But in the service economy, in the front end, it is making its presence felt, right? Robots which are used in some of the service sector, you would be not be surprised if I tell you that robots are also used in prostitution, in the sex services, right? Or brothels and that kind of a space. Farming, retail sector, aged care, healthcare, you name it. And robots are being used to a larger extent all over the world. So it's a topic worthy of examination that how it is impacting marketing of services <clears throat> and marketing in general. As a result of AI, some of the long-term trends that are happening, that what does AI bring to the marketing of services? Now, what AI helps is the faster communication, the capability of the firms, right? Today, Google need not communicate to you. Google communicates to you through its Google Home Mini, right? So communication is instant. Collect and store data. Now today, AI has made like massive progress in the space of collection and storage of data because data is the new oil, they call it, right? So the next, uh, next decade or next two to three decades is going to be fight for data. Who has the best data is going to have the best or achieve competitive advantage in the market. So data is the new oil and who has the capacity to analyze. So data scientists, machine learning experts, who will these gigabytes and trillions of gigabytes of data, they can churn to come up with insights about consumer behavior, advertising, promotion, placement, so on and so forth, right? So AI has the capacity to do CCA, communicate, collect and store, and analyze the data. AI can do all of this instantaneously. So let me take you back 30 years. 30 years back when my father used to bank, right? My father is almost 75 now, right? So when I compare my father's banking ability and how he used to bank and how I bank, you know, in my life, I would have gone to bank probably three times. Say in Australia, 10 years, eight years in Australia, I could have gone three times. Once when I opened the bank account in a different bank, once to close the bank account, and third, to open another bank account. Probably in eight years, I could have visited three times the bank. However, my father, every month he goes to the bank or probably every two weeks because he does not use ATMs. He just goes to a bank, writes a check, still deposits checks and withdraws money using the check, the traditional system. So that we call as service encounter 1.0 where technology is not being used by consumers to a larger extent. So how does Service Encounter 1.0 look like? So when my father goes to a bank, still the bank employees of the bank helps him to do the banking transaction. So when you do a banking transaction, you write a check and you withdraw money, how fast, how smooth that transaction is, that creates value for my father. If there is delayed, then value is not created. So to create value for my father, you need my father, who is the customer, you need the employees who are the people at the terror counter and you need the service firm, which is the bank itself. So it's a three-way interaction that creates value for my father. And my father withdraws money, he's happy, comes home and gets into his daily life. And this is called the service triangle model. Anybody who is interested in services should know this, right? So when my father interacts with the bank directly. When someone calls from the bank and tries to convince him for a product, they are engaging in something called external marketing, where I make promises. When there is an interaction between the bank and its employees, I want to take care of my employees. We call it an internal marketing. And employees are the people who enable promises that companies make, right? 
And finally, it's interactive marketing. So when my father goes to the bank teller, the, the interaction, the communication, the small talk between the frontline teller people and my father, that's called interactive marketing. So value is created in Service Encounter 1.0 as a result of this three-way interaction between three parties, the customer, the employees, and the company, right? So you need a multi-stakeholder approach to create value. That's Service Encounter 1.0. And please make a note, this is called Service Triangle. Fast forward 30 years. Now I am in business. I have my own family. I do banking. How do I do banking? The way I do banking, I just use a banking app. I don't even have to log into, say, www.hdfcbank.com. So that's the only bank account I got in India so far still for the last 15 years, right? So I'm, I'm a staunch loyal customer of HDFC Bank, right? So, but Service Encounter 2.0. The bank that I use here is Bankwest. It's the local bank of Western Australia. But how do I bank? I simply use my apps. If I have to transfer money, I use app. If I have to buy something, I use my app. If I have to sell something, I use my app. So all my transaction is based on a platform which we call as application. In short form, it's called app, right? What is the change between how my father used to bank and how I bank? And why that change? That change is because of technology, right? So we still have a service triangle. We still need to create value. HDFC needs to create value for me. Bankwest needs to create value for me. But I don't visit the bank. So what can help create value? Technology can help create value for me. I call that technology as artificial intelligence because Bankwest has some sort of a device, some sort of an AI interface through which it understands my needs, my banking needs. And even without reaching, even without calling, I can interact with a chatbot through my app with my bank. So that chatbot is nothing but an AI solution. So I'm not using technology, I'm using a specific form of technology, which is artificial intelligence enabled chatbots, right? So I open a bank account, I close my bank account. There are different types of accounts that I manage in my app. Everything happens through chatbot. I rarely pick up a phone and talk to a real human being. I always interact with chatbot, right? So this AI has the potential to impact the relationship between employees and customers. This AI has the impact on the interaction between customers and service firm. This AI has the impact on the interaction between employees and service firms. And if you see, all of these are positive impact. When chatbot is not making any mistake, I am creating value for my customers, right? When the app is not making any mistake, I am creating value for my bank customer. So value creation is happening. However, there are instances that you might have heard in the last one month in Australia, two major financial institutions have been hacked. One insurance company and one bank, uh, one mobile service provider. There has been cyber attacks consistently on these two companies, right? So when there are cyber attacks, people always have an apprehension on using their data on those solutions. So in that case, there is a value destruction. So when this AI has a negative impact on any of this triangle arm, I have value destruction because I am concerned about my well-being. I'm concerned who is going to misuse my information, my demographic data, my psychographic data, my uh, family-related data, right? My transaction-related data. If someone can hack my bank, I mean, this means that my data is being compromised, right? So if that is the situation, then value is not created, value is destroyed. So it's not all gaga about artificial intelligence, robotics, and technology. Technology is a double-edged sword. It has the ability to create massive benefits to society. 
And you just go to Google and type cyber attack in Australia, you will find in the last month, we got two massive cyber attacks in this country, right? On two big companies. And that's the other side of the sword where technology is being misused by cyber attackers. In that case, you destroy value, you don't create value. So how do you safeguard? So the question that Australian government is asking, and I'm sure that's the question that any government, even the Indian government, will have on the top of their agenda, how to secure citizens' data, right? Because India is now a connected, connected economy, right? With all the Aadhaar card that I know, and with all these unique identification numbers and stuff like that, they are trying to connect the economy. Now, when you connect the economy using technology, the biggest trade-off is secrecy and privacy of citizens' data. When that is compromised, you destroy value. So this is an updated version of Service Encounter 1.0, which leads way to Service Encounter 2.0, which is the characteristic feature of Industry 4.0 that we are experiencing as we speak today. As a result of this, what type of values firms create, right? Seamless patient experience. Uh, I need to say this is customer experience, okay? Because I was presenting this to a hospital a few months ago. I forgot to edit that. So this is called seamless customer experience, right? So if I want a banking transaction, I don't have to take an auto rickshaw or a cab or a taxi or a car, go through the traffic. I just take my phone, log in, and seamless transaction, right? Service convenience, all of these are not patients, these are all companies and their customers. Personalized patient service. So let me let me edit this here. This is customer experience. I was pitching this to a CEO of a hospital for some money to do research. So personalized customer experience, enjoyment at service firm. So these are all the positive values that you create when you are having a positive impact by AI on the service triangle, right? However, Fabio, you know, Fabio was the first robot to be fired by a retailer. So it was commissioned by a Scottish retailer. We wrote a case study last year at Harvard Business uh, Review. Uh, on Fabio. So if you are interested, you can go and find out that case study called Margiota Food and Wine. Why it was decommissioned? They installed it to help customers. What happens is this guy started malfunctioning. So instead of helping, it was scaring the customer. It was creating a feeling of creepiness in the minds of the customer. So customers started complaining about Fabio to the company. So in a jiffy, they had to decommission it. So in that way, the intention was to create value, but it was destroying value. So in that case, they decommissioned it, right? So again here, I will change. Just give me a moment. Customer. Customer's privacy issue. Customers' secrecy issue. Cost to service firms. Right? So these are the negative things we already discussed. Right? But what's changing? What's the role of AI in this case? Now, again, I took an example of healthcare. Why I took an example of healthcare? Because for the last two years, we are heavily engaged in uh, research in the healthcare space, right? Now, if you look at AI acts, or AI has three key roles. AI acts as a supporter, AI acts as an augmenter, and AI acts as a performer. So this is the customer, this is the frontline employee, it could be a doctor, and the artificial intelligence. So IBM InnerEye is an example of that, which helps oncologists to look at cancer cells, right? So this is an interaction where AI helps identify cancer cells. Then AI augmentation, which is a robot-assisted surgery, or AI perform, where chatbots, so I'm just talking about the chatbots, or the hotel robots, where you interact. The customer directly interacts with the 
robots, right? So any service encounter will be impacted by AI in three ways. One, AI directly performs, AI augments the service in terms of nursing, in terms of robot assisted surgery, or AI supports in identification of a, or in diagnosis. So some of our results, we are not able to share now because it's not yet published, but at least a brief glance. So what is the changing between service encounter 1.0 to service encounter 2.0? When my father used to bank, he's still banking, but his mindset is still service encounter 1.0, right? Now, what is service encounter? Service encounter is the interaction between customer and the company, customer and the service provider. So what is changing from my father's time and my way of banking? Only one thing has changed or changing is the interactions. How my father interacts with the bank and how I interact with the bank. I interact with technology being the facilitator. My father still prioritizes a human being in an interaction. That is the key difference, right? So that's service encounter 1.0. It's always human to human, human to company, human. So human is critical in service encounter 1.0. However, in service encounter 2.0, I'm talking to the bank through a chatbot, right? So it is AI which takes the precedence. And to your utter surprise, if you have two Google Home Minis in a home, they talk to each other. Have you ever realized that? If you anybody has two Google Home Minis or three Google Home Minis in one home on the same network connection, these Google Home Minis have the capacity to talk to each other. Right, So that is called object-to-object -object interaction, which we capture in our research as AI-to-AI -AI interaction. For example, your, your watch is connected to your phone. So your watch constantly interacts with your phone. Your phone may be connected to your smart fridge. So your phone constantly interacts with your smart fridge. Your smart fridge must be connected to your home internet through Google Home Mini. Right. So object-to-object -object interaction is a reality today. And that has the capacity to serve people, to help patients, to help customers, to help people in the aged care facility using a robot, right? So there is a massive, massive change that Service Encounter 2.0 has brought to the domain of services. Are you still with me? Let me check. Are you still with me? Are you still with me? Anyone? Yes, sir. Okay, that's good. I thought I'm talking to an AI. I'm just checking whether humans are still there. So the key to SC 2.0 is AI to AI interaction. And that is the key that we need to consider. So in Service Encounter 2.0, artificial intelligence plays the central role and it is also an actor in value creation and value destruction, right? And that's the key. We're do, doing a research with a humanoid nurse that what is the ability and the capacity of a humanoid nurse to serve patients in the healthcare setup? Because patients don't like to be or a little wary about being served by a humanoid robot. But Hansen Electronics has actually come up with a, with a humanoid nurse called Grace. And they have given us permission to use that particular uh, uh, stimulus for research. And our research is clearly saying that there is an, an apathy towards use of humanoid as a nurse in the healthcare setting. People still want to be served by human nurse. But more and more robots are penetrating or AI is penetrating the services sector. But why do we need to bother about whether AI is good for us, whether AI is bad for us, right? As a service provider, why do we need to care, right? Because of the AI's capabilities. AI has the capability to automate processes. AI has the capacity to gain insights. And AI has the capacity to engage with customers. And that is the reason people or 
service firms care about using AI, not for AI for the sake of AI, but AI for the capabilities that AI has and can add to the competitive advantage of the company, right? And if you look at this, that any service encounter with AI will help you to acquire new customers. And this is Marketing 101. Marketing 101 is, there are only two reasons for which marketers exist. One is to acquire customers. Two is to retain customers. And AI has the capabilities to help you do both, right? And S is a service encounter with AI can also help you to develop customers. That means if you are using one product, can I upsell and cross-sell other products using AI? It is good, bad, God only knows, but that is one of the marketing strategies that companies have used for ages. Now AI can crunch data, your historical data, and provide insights that the other day I got an email from HDFC Bank and uh, I, because I use once a month to kind of transfer some money to my parents back home. And so I don't use one NRE account. I usually use that NRO account, right? So in the last year or two years, I have not used my NRE account. So they, they might have looked at my transaction. They sent me an email for the last 12 months. You, you have not used or done any transactions. So this account has been dormant, right? If we request you, to make one deposit or one transaction to make it again active. Now, with an AI solution, these are very easy to identify. AI will do it in a flip second, right? It will go through my entire history and give the insight that Sanjit has been using NRO account for the last two years, not NRE account, and why is he using that? So now it has given me a nudge to use my dormant account. And this is coming from behavioral economics. So if anybody has read this book called The Nudge, right? So it's a digital nudge that HDFC Bank has done so that I use my NRE account also. Because in NRE account, you can only deposit foreign currency, right? So, so I would request you, if you ever get time, read this book called The Nudge, right? So all HDFC doing is it's nudging me to use that account, which has been dormant for ages, right? But why? Because customer acquisition, customer retention, customer development, all of these three keys of marketing is related to the favorable customer and firm level outcomes. What is the favorable customer level outcome? Customer loyalty. There is enough literature on customer loyalty, right? So if you read the work by Fred Reichold from Bain and Company, he has spent 30, 40 years of his life on examining customer loyalty. So we spend resources as service provider on acquisition, retention, and development because so as to make customers frequent purchases, which has been shown to have a positive correlation with sales growth rate and firm performance. And AI has big capabilities to direct all those strategies of marketing, right? So there, but along with these positive elements, there are some debates that whether tech is important or touch is important. So this tech versus touch is not a new debate, but this debate has taken a new form, a new shape, given the re-emergence of artificial intelligence in the business landscape, right? Most of the debate is about substitution, right? So when I read this, it reminds me of the communist era of West Bengal. I grew up in the communist era of West Bengal, okay? So I'm not a political person. I'm not commenting on any political party. But I grew up in the communist era of West Bengal. All my childhood, my youth, my young age, everything happened in the communist West Bengal. And one thing that I've always seen, the political narrative was around technology will substitute employees. And now that communists are not around, we still have that debate that... AI is going to substitute, is going to eat up your job. But people are not seeing the brighter side of it, that AI will also create hundreds and thousands of job opportunities with a different skill set, right? Data scientists, machine, machine learning experts, robot processes, automation experts, and so on and so forth, right? 
So let us look at the writer side of AI, where touch and tech can work together to help customers to create value, right? Now, one example that comes to my mind is from our ongoing research with one of the largest hospitals in WA, where we interviewed radiologists, oncologists, surgeons. And we understood a couple of ideas from radiologists. Like, so a radiologist is a human being. I'm sure some of you have done x-rays and MRIs and other things in your, in your medical history. I recently had to do an MRI and a CT scan for some problem I was having. And then I asked these guys that what happens to my scan? So when they scan, they create the, the film, they send it to the radiologist. The radiologist is only a human, right? So he is going through so many reports, hundreds of customers. He's prone to make mistakes. However, if you feed all this information to an AI solution, say IBM Watson, which has the capability to read radiology scripts or radiology films, then he can see or the, the AI can see what a human eye cannot see, right? And this is happening in oncology space. This is happening in the radiology space. So it, this is a classic example of technology helping a radiologist to make a better diagnosis, right? So we always are looking through the lens of positive psychology that AI has a lot to give rather than take from the society, right? So the rise of AI and machine and robots calls for a new human-machine collaboration. It's not about chucking the machine out of the window. We cannot live without technology. We have to accept that fact. As a citizen, as a customer, as a family, we need technology, right? So how best to harness the power of technology is the question. So it's better to do more research. So it's better to understand that it's not a race against the machines. It's not that Terminator is there. How many of you have watched this movie called The Terminator? Maybe of my young age movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? So Terminator, right? Half man, half machine. It's not that who is going to win. Both of us are going to win. Technology and human, right? So it's a race with machines. It's about extending and augmenting human capabilities, not replacing them, right? So our focus is on augmentation, not substitution. When I say our means, my team. I work with two to three teams. I'm leading at least two projects on AI. And you know, you'll be surprised day after tomorrow, I have one of the biggest submissions on my first paper on AI solutions, right? So fingers crossed. And we are taking the lens of augmentation. How can AI help companies do better service or provide better service. So with this, another five minutes and I will close. So I will, there is another book called The Experience Economy by Pine and Gilmore. So as I said, that I'm a service researcher and customer experience management is one of my key research areas. So if anybody who is researching in the space of experience has to read this book called The Experience Economy, where the idea is experience is the common denominator in the economy. To perform well, say if you are a Starbucks, I'm sure Starbucks is in India now, it's the, one of the largest coffee chains in the world, then you need to create experience which customers remember. That was the theme till say 2010. But since AI and robotics and advanced technology are making their presence felt, a new article by Huang and Rust and the book called The Feeling Economy came, which makes a case that it's time for us to move from creating experiences to creating empathy, feeling, right? So there is an emergence of a new form of economy called the feeling economy. And how does it look? So there are three types of intelligence here. See, One is called mechanical intelligence and thinking intelligence. Now what Huang and Rust says in their book is, that machines or machine learning or artificial intelligence, they are capable of doing both of this. You give them trillions of gigabytes of data, they will churn it like that. Human mind is not capable to do such automated analysis. So machines are great at these two. Let them do that. But fortunately, you know what? 
machines still do not have a heart. They can think, but they cannot feel. Oh, I'm on the right side. Okay. On the left side here. So they cannot feel. We have the heart on the left side, I believe. Okay. So none of these machines have a feeling part. They don't have a heart. They can read your face, but they can't feel for you. They can smile. They can cry, but they can't feel for you. Right? If you program them to smile, they will smile, reading your facial expression. So what Wang and Rusty says that there is an emergence of an economy where let machines take the job of thinking and mechanical intelligence. Let them churn the data. Let them collect the data. Let them come up with the insights. And once they come up with the insights, now use the nudging, behavioral economics, and create an empathetic relationship with the customers. That's the feeling. And humans are still capable of feeling for other humans. And a company, as they define, is nothing but a collection of human beings, right? So the frontline employees are still humans who can feel for the human customers. So let the, the, the AI and robotics take the backstage. We humans, we manage the front stage of the services. And that way, we can collaborate with technology to create value for the customer in this new economy, which Wong and Rust calls as the feeling economy, right? So what we argue in our research, and most of our AI and robotics paper are going to come out next year, let us work with AI and robots and let us change the world one paper at a time, one issue at a time, right? Thank you very much. Namaste. I'm open for questions. Students, if you have any queries, they can you, then you can ask, sir. Yeah, Akanksha, you have any query? <laughs> I think don't forget to unmute your mic. No from <laughs> am I audible, sir? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, okay. I think uh, no queries from student side. Now we'll proceed for the conclusion of the session. Uh, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on the certificate course on marketing management. I, Dr. Sapna Ghutke from Department of Commerce and Management, stand here to express gratefulness and to conclude the session. First and foremost, I am thankful to honorable guest speaker, Dr. Sanjeet K. Roy, that he has spared his valuable time for us. Thank you so much for today's session, sir. It was really interesting one. Now, I extend my sincere thanks to Professor R.C. Gulhane, President of Prerna Seva Mandal, and Dr. S.C. Gulhane, the Secretary of Prerna Seva Mandal, Mrs. Abhilasha Gurde, ma'am, CEO of Prerna Seva Mandal, for their guidance and support. I am grateful to Dr. Praveen Joshi, Director, Prerna College of Commerce, for his directions and motivation. My special thanks to Dr. Leela Dhar Officiating Principal, Prerna College of Commerce, for his valuable guidance and inspiration. Last but not the least, I am thankful to all the participants, faculty members, and students for their cooperation for making this program successful. Thank you so much, everyone. 
and now with the permission of chair i declare that the fourth session of the certificate course in marketing management is over thank you so much everyone have a good evening thank you take care bye bye thank you sir